All right, well, let's dive straight into God's Word this morning, uh, and I want to share with you uh, something we've been uh, through the uh, last theme, last day of the theme we've been going through, which is sowing and reaping in those small words behind me you can see on the screen, uh, sowing and reaping. And so I have the privilege today to be able to just com- conclude in that se- uh, this theme in the morning, and um, and I do love this, and I'm going to ju- jump straight into the Bible this morning, Genesis 8.22, to set us up as we go. And uh, this Bible verse says this, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, shall not cease. So while the earth remains, when I'm reading this, seed time and harvest will also remain. And the truth is that we are constantly sowing whether we like it or not. We are continually sowing and we're continually reaping. How are we doing that? With the way that we speak, our behavior, our actions, our thoughts. And when we sow, roots grow. And where roots grow, fruits grow. And so my consideration this morning and my challenge is this, that for my own life, is that it's really important that we consider what we sow and the value of that. Now, I know only too well the value of sowing when we were first married 17 years ago, next month actually, note to self, gift to get for Nicola. Um, um, and, um, And I wanted to be a professional gardener. And all the gardeners said, okay. (laughs) But not only that, I wanted to be a professional indoor gardener. Uh Indoor plants, bonsai trees. I was set to be the gardener of the year. Uh, Not so so much. And so I decided, um, you know, I had high ambitions then to do a herb garden, some tomato plants, some indoor plants, and also a bonsai tree, because they're amazing. Mini trees are awesome. And so I started off on the journey of putting all these plants in the house. (laughs) And just I longed for just some herbs to put onto some food, a slice of tomato from a sandwich that I'd made in my own garden, because it feels so good to do that. And then more recently, I tried to grow an avocado plant in Australia. It Somebody didn't tell me, they should have, that it's one of the most difficult things to grow is an avocado, and I didn't do very well. And, um, but the truth is, I never ever got a harvest from anything that I planted. And all of the plants that I did plant died. So I decided that being a professional gardener was not for me. Um, but I, I persevered for a few years But the truth is, there's a gap in between the reaping and the sowing, and that gap's name is nurturing. It's nurturing. And I'd forgotten the importance and the power of nurturing. So I'd I'd not water the plants, I'd go on holiday and come back and go, I'd walk through the door and go, no, forgot to water the plants, so they're all dead. All right, I would overwater if I was feeling particularly generous. I would like pour water and, she, and Nick would come up and say, is the water supposed to be coming out the bottom onto the windowsill? No, it's not, but we, we got through it and I'd either leave in the sun or I wouldn't leave in the sun. I'd leave in the direct uh, wind path or I wouldn't. It's so complicated gardening. I didn't realise that. I thought you just threw the seed in and off you went. Um, But the truth is, nurturing is such a big part of seeing the harvest that we want to see. Nurturing simply means this, to care for and protect whilst growing. That's what it means. Whilst, I love the word whilst. (laughs) To care for and protect whilst, just out emphasis for you guys this morning, that's all it is. And and today I want to talk about the principle of nurturing our seeds and what we sow in the context of friendships and in the context of relationships, that we ought to be deliberate about what we sow into our friendships and relationships, that it's not just by chance that we cast seed into our friendships and our relationships, but we do this deliberately and we do it whilst nurturing because Lighthouse Church, this is what we want to see in our friendships, stronger healthier, life-giving, resilient, friendships that continue to grow and develop and expand. 
Agreed? See, that's who we are. But there's some nurturing to be done in the midst before the reaping. So the title of my message this morning as we take notes is Don't Neglect to Nurture. And remember here, we're talking about the context of friendships and relationships today. You know, I used to travel a lot for work and this is really my first point as we start to talk about this in the context of friendships and relationships. I used to travel a lot for work on my own. And so I would drive through the Austrian mountains with the waterfalls on one side and some beautiful snow across there. And I'd look up and go, wow, Jono, it's beautiful. You know, a little tear in my eye. And then I'd look over to the passenger seat and I'd, you know, I wouldn't move across because I'd be driving, that'd be dangerous. But I imagined I was there as well. I'd go, yeah, Jono, you're so right. It's amazing, isn't it? And I'd go, yeah, just so picturesque. Should we jump out and get a photo together? Yes, let's get out and take a photo together. Are you sure? Can we pull up? Yeah, let's pull up and... And what I realized in that moment is that I was on my own, first of all, and I'm going mad, slightly. Um, There's a lot of things I realized in that moment. But what I realized, and God spoke to me in that moment, is that we were never meant to do life alone. We were meant to enjoy things together, all of us, in community, in friendship and relationship. And I discovered that doing life alone is boring. It's boring. You know, the... the, um, the assumption sometimes can be that doing life on your own without friends and those around you is easier because we've all been hurt, right? There's been times in our life where there's been challenges. We've maybe been mistreated or misunderstood. But my encouragement today as we get into this message together and my heart and my prayer this week has been that we step into friendship and relationship once more. That it becomes the thing that energizes us For another day. This is what the Bible says about friendship. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. And a brother born for a time of adversity. Proverbs 27, 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. So does the sweetness of a friend's counsel that comes from the heart. You see, we were born to be here for one another through the thick and the thin. To be the friend that walks alongside somebody that when they can't quite see the next step in front of the other, you're the one there next to them to speak life and vision and hope over the future. You're there to put an arm around, to cry with, to laugh with, to celebrate life with, to walk through with. This is the power of friendship. And I've got good news for you today that you can ask God for those friends in your world. Did you know that? You can ask him. You're thinking, oh, I need some friends like that in my life. Lord, give me a friend. Let me have somebody in my life that will walk with me, that will encourage me, that will see the best in me. You can ask God today. How amazing is that? How easy that is that God will answer as well. But I've also discovered at Lighthouse here, That yes, we can pray for friends, but I think also God is calling us to be that friend to somebody else. You see that we're not here at Lighthouse, we're not just inward looking, but we're outward looking. We're looking to those around us that we can be a friend to. You know, I'm reminded when Nick and I went to, in the UK, we moved from Sheffield to Liverpool. And we upped sticks and we moved houses and uh, we knew nobody in Liverpool and we were going to help there uh, with a C3 church. Absolute privilege to do that. But when we landed, we were alone and we knew no one. Better than the 8.30, so you're all good. Um, We knew nobody. We knew new... We woke up in the morning, it was kind of like, what should we do today? Let's invite... Nick, I'm going to invite you out for dinner because I don't know anybody else, only my wife. That wasn't the only reason. I love you as well. (laughs) Nailed it. Oh, Lord. And and we started to complain and say, no, I can't believe it. I can't believe we've got no one in our worlds that we can hang out with. And then God clearly spoke to both of us and said to us, be the friend that you want to have. You see, what God was teaching us in this moment in our character and who we were, he was teaching us that friendship for us had to be more than just about what we could get out of it. 
and take from it and much more about what we could sow into it and what we could invest and put into friendship. This is, um, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples in John 15, 12 to 13. My command is this, and who knows? When Jesus says command, he's pretty serious. It's like when Nicola uses my full name. It's pretty serious. And all the uh, husbands said amen. Um, they did as well. Don't do that. You'll get yourself into serious trouble doing that. John 15, 12 to 13, Jesus speaking to his disciples. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Great love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. What a starting point for friendships from Jesus himself. Before we talk about some of the things that we can sow into our friendships, we've got to know the foundation of our friendships. And it starts right here in this verse. Love each other as I have loved you. Great love is no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. This is Jesus speaking. And just a few chapters later we read, just a few verses later we read, Jesus lays down his life. He already knew that this was going to be the case. But he made a decision there to declare that and speak that over those he called his friends. And he laid down his life. And you know, this morning, if you're in this place and you're new and you don't yet know Jesus, well, look, at the end of the service, I'm going to invite you to pray with me. And if you want to get to know Jesus more and, what, and who he is and how he laid down his life for you, there's going to be an opportunity for you as well at the end of this service to do that. But he says these two things. He says, love, uh, love, to love one another. Well, whenever I read the word, when I, when I see something like that, my immediate question is, well, what is love? You know, love one, it's very easy to read over that sometimes. But what is love? So I started to look up what love meant. And full disclaimer here, I am still working on most of it, 100% of what is said in this scripture. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7. This is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Wow. If we were to base our friendships and relationships on a God-given love like this, you can be sure what you will reap is life-giving friendships. And us at Lighthouse Church, my encouragement today is this, that we live our lives with 1 Corinthians 13 as the filter in which we see those around us. How incredible. And the second thing Jesus says here is, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. And I wanted to spend a little bit more time on that as we unpack a few things that we can do to sow into our friendships for healthy growing. And the first thing we can do, and the first point is this, we forgive quickly and often. If you want to nurture friendships, if you want to reap in friendships the harvest that you're expecting, then you, we forgive quickly and often. It's a big challenge, eh? I can feel a room going, oh, yeah, well, you don't know. I do know, because I used to play soccer, or as we say in the UK, football, which is a real, the real football sport um, and uh, so what I used to do when we played soccer in the UK I played for a couple of different teams and sometimes I'd get uh, fouled off the ball when the ref wasn't looking way better again um, and I sometimes I get fouled and, and you know my as a, gr as a good Christian <laughs> as a good Christian I'd always say bless you Bless you in Jesus' name. Walk on. Oh, you broke my leg. It's fine. It's good. No, what I would do is, I would then hunt for that person for the rest of the game. If I had a, if I had a bow and arrow, I would hunt them with that as well. And I would make sure that I accidentally, on purpose, tackled them back and fouled them. Uh, because that's what unforgiveness and offence looks like. It looks like this, to get back or to get even. You see, in the Lighthouse Church, that's not where we live. 
<laughs> yeah. Not for long. We shouldn't, by the way. But you know the pain of that. You know, it's inju- the injustice of being treated in that way. And sometimes with, with unforgiveness and offense, that can happen. We can hold on to things. Psalm 103, 10 to 14. He does not treat, this is, he does, this is David speaking. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. You see, again here, we're talking about the foundation of friendships and relationships first. This is where it comes from. This is the rock in which we build our lives. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And the father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. This is it. This is it. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers we are dust. Wow. Inevitably in friendships, Someone's going to say something you don't like. Everyone's like, no, no, never. Oh, come on, come on. Let's be honest this morning. I'm the same here. They might look at us the wrong way. They might not celebrate us. They forget our birthday. 8th of March, by the way. Um, <laughs> if you've got your calendar handy, um, annual reminder. Um, no, they might not return our call or a text message. Oh, my But we cannot allow unforgiveness to build walls of separation across our lives. Because here's the foundation. Let us not forget that those around us are also human. In the same way that we are. When I think about unforgiveness and offense, I think about a time Nick and I, many years ago, before we had children, we had the privilege of going over to Uganda to help uh, with Toto Children's Choir, actually, with help building houses and some schools, and, and the most incredible trip, and the most eye-opening experience, and heartbreaking experience of our lives. But I remember one thing we had to do, we had to manually make bricks for the houses. And the way that you'd make a brick, the bricks is you get the mud, and the, I've got some builders in the room, so disclaimer, if I get this a little bit wrong, please don't judge me, okay? So you get the dirt and the mud, this is how they did it here, and they mix it all together with everything else that goes in there as well, Um, and they mix it all in there, and then what they do then with the mud and the clay and everything else, they then put it into a brick maker, which is just a manual brick maker with a long arm on it, which seemed long for me, and and what they did then is they grab the arm and they clamp the arm down and push as hard as they can on that arm to create the brick, put the lever back up, and out pops a brick. Amazing. Amazing. And then so what you'd do is you'd repeat that over and over again. But you see, unforgiveness and offense, I'm reminded of that story because it can do the same thing. We can play with the offense and the unforgiveness. We can mix it together and then we place it in the brick maker. And what we do next then is we clamp down the unforgiveness and we put the brick in the, in the sun to dry. You see what happens then is when we continue to do that, we start to pick up the bricks and we start to place them around our lives. You see, that can happen. And we start to pick them up and we start to build walls to our left and to our right. And we stop being able to see over these walls and we create division between us and those around us. We're not able to speak to certain people. We're not able to talk about certain topics because there's a brick wall in the way. And my encouragement this morning is this, that the Holy Spirit wants to melt away those walls of unforgiveness in your life. You see, because the enemy would love for you to live in your own brick wall house as such, covered and not able to look up and beyond. But the calling here for us at Lighthouse is that we look up and beyond ourselves. And it requires us to forgive quickly and often. Amen. Amen. Ephesians 4.31, get rid of bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another. Here we go. Here's the platform. Here's a springboard for why we do what we do. Just as God through Christ has forgiven you. See, that is the foundation of your friendships today, church. 
And the word there that hits me every single time is the word instead. Because church, we live on the other side of instead. We have a choice to make today not to carry offense and unforgiveness. Bear with each other and and forgive one another, Colossians, Paul talks about. And if any of you has grievance against someone, here we go again, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Wow. What does forgiveness do? It keeps our hearts soft. It removes judgment. It strengthens and nurtures. And most importantly, and most valuably, it brings back unity. We have a little saying in our family, which is, you can withdraw your time in challenging situations, but never withdraw your love. We have another saying now, which is this. And we've just added to it. You can withdraw your time, but never withdraw your forgiveness. Wow. Because it's what God wants to do in you here. All right. Number t- is that good? Yeah. Happy? Ready? To step into number two. Number two, speak life and encouragement over your friends and those in your life. Romans 15.2. Paul writes, each of us should please our neighbor for our own good. Nope. Uh, Each of us should please our neighbor for their good, to build them up. You see, oh, nearly lost the pulpit. Um, You see, the thing is, sometimes it's not easy to encourage others, particularly when we're going through things ourselves, right? It can be a challenge to look up and out beyond ourselves, But what Paul is encouraging us to do here is to speak life and encouragement over others deliberately to build them up. To deliberately build them up. My question today is what is it you're speaking over your friends? I'm challenged with it always. When was the last time you called a friend to simply say, you're excellent? When was the last time you dropped a friend a message with no other motive than to build them up? You see, your words are incredible. Your words are so powerful. The Bible talks about them being able to bring life and death. It's an amazing gift from God. The words that we speak can create a future that we want to see. You see, what's the future you see in your friend's life right now? You see, what, what is it, your promise that you've discovered for them from the word of God that you're speaking over them right now? I love that we, we, have, a, um, we have a Bible study group here at Lighthouse, one of, the ama- one of the amazing many groups that we have across the place. And I, I just love uh, this, this story here of two friends within our Bible study group that we've been, we've been praying for one of them. And it's just an amazing thing to see this friendship blossoming. Blossoming, I love that word. Um, and what, what, the reason I say that is because this one friend's been desperate for a new job. He's been believing God and trusting God for a new job. And what I've seen happen is this other friend has come around his life and put his arm around him. And he started to look up and see that person. And I love it because we have this little WhatsApp thing going as well for, this, for the Bible study group. And, and one friend said to the other, he posted this immediately after we're praying. Ephesians 3, 20, 21. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What was he doing? What, I, I asked myself, why did he say that to his friend? He was cementing God's promises over his life. Because that's what we do. That's what we're called to do. We're called to cement God's promises on those around us. And our words are the very thing in which we do that. And that's what, for me, groups is all about. And it's not even a a plug for groups. It's a way of life for us. It's a place where we can discover and nurture friendships and relationships because the truth is the group isn't always about, it is as well, But it isn't always just about what we get, but it's about what we bring. You see, your best friends, it's never really about what you're getting from them. It's about what you're giving to them and bringing to them. It's so countercultural, isn't it? It's so countercultural. You know, we're there to be called as friends that push our friends forward. That have an arm around them in times of challenge and we... Weep and we cry with them. 
we celebrate, their, celebrate with them along the way. And we create moments and memories. And we speak words that impact eternity on them. We move from just a compliment to a friend to a faith-filled declaration over their life. That with friends, we move beyond the surface and we go deep heart to heart. And we speak over them things that they might not see right now. And that power you carry in your life. You see, I've got a friend. And he tells me sometimes, well, he tells me lots of things, actually. Uh, some, some that I have to take on for a little while, but he's always right. But I've got a friend that said to me when we moved to Australia, we knew nobody. He simply said this to me. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. And when I thought about that, I just thought about the power of our words, that you can be somebody's light in their world. You can be the one that says it's going to be okay. Tomorrow is going to look brighter. I know a God that can and a God that will. You know, your text, your phone call, you never, never know. You never, never know the eternal impact of stepping outside of yourself and building somebody else. You never know. I love that. I love those stories that you hear when, and you've probably maybe been on either side of this story, when, when somebody says to you, they didn't even know what I was going through. But just at the right time, I received that care package. I received that phone call. Wow, powerful. Because it's those small things in those nurturing that make the big things happen. It's the same with your children. You speak over them, don't you? You speak God's word over them. You speak encouragement and life. Well, Hebrews 10, 24, I'm nearly finished, guys. 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching, encouraging, placing courage in somebody else's life. Placing courage, speaking courage, calling out what God has got on the inside of them to the surface. Because the world wants to suppress that. It wants to hold it back. It's self-preservation. It's what I can get. But the truth here, Lighthouse, is that we live differently, eh? Don't we? We live differently. We live in the pursuit of pushing others forward and believing the best for people. The final point is this as we start to come to a close. The third point is this. The way that we nurture friendships is that we direct people to Jesus. I love the story in Mark 2. When Jesus comes back home to Capernaum, he gets, I'll just set the context, he, is set, he, he comes home and he's in the house and the house begins to fill because people have heard all about this Jesus. And the house spills out into the front, into the streets. And four friends rock up late, probably. I'm just expanding my own imagination here because they get there and they're like, oh, there's, the crowds are too big. We can't even get close to Jesus. But what does a good friend do in that situation? Because what their good friend, their friends do, they're bringing their paralyzed friend to Jesus. He can't walk. He can't make it there himself right now. He, he can't. He, he, he struggled. You know, they're probably late because he's like, nah, don't worry about me, don't worry about... Nah, a good friend will always bring the other person with them to Jesus. And he say, nah, just leave me behind, you're going to hold me up. Nah, nah, nah. We walk at your pace. And so what they do, they pick up this stretcher and they carry it and they say, oh, nah, nah, there's no way. And one of the friends sparks up and says, right, what we're going to do is we're going to get through the roof. It's a bit like, probably Sam, probably Sam would say that because he's a bit of an extremist. Just like parachute in over the, no, we didn't do that. And so they said, do you know what we're going to do? We're going to climb up the house and we're going to, we're going to, we're going to break our way through the roof. And we're going to lower our friend to Jesus. Why, 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 why did they do that? 
because they didn't have the answer, but they knew the one that did. You see, they didn't have the answer there. It was, the miracle wasn't in them, but they were part of the miracle. How amazing is that? That today, church, I encourage you that you, those, those words you've spoken over people, the things that the, sow, the seed that you think you've just sown and scattered, it's much more than that. Every small deed, every small word you've spoken over people, let me encourage you today, when you attach your faith to it, when it's planted in God's word, it reaps a harvest in that person's life. And so they brought him to Jesus and Jesus did what we couldn't. He healed his heart and then he healed his legs. And the man ran out of there with a new life. The reason we bring people to Jesus is because we're believing for them a new life. One that's whole, one that's forgiven, one that sees a future, one that has a future beyond the horizon. The horizon begins to broaden when we bring people to Jesus. It's a pressure off moment because the miracle belongs to God. Let me put it another way. We do, this, we do the natural and God does the super. <sighs> Forgive quickly. Speak life and encouragement over our friends and direct people to Jesus. That is how we nurture friendships.